Hi, this is Keith Kirkpatrick, Research Director with the Futurum Group, and welcome to 6.5 On The Road. Today, I'm really happy to have Tara DeZeo, Director of Product Marketing with Pegasystems, here as my guest to talk about the ad tech and martech space. Welcome, Tara. Thank you for having me, Keith. It's really great to be here. Well, there's a lot of really great stuff going on here at Pegaworld this week. And I kind of wanted to delve into an area that maybe we won't be talking about that much at the show, but sure. I know is an area that's really interesting to me and yeah. you. And that is the current state of the MarTech and AdTech space, given that we're, we're really at a crossroads here in terms of you know, what data can be used, what can't be. Maybe you can just kind of give uh, folks a, an idea of where we are in the space right now. Yeah, so, you know, we've been talking about this for 10 years, but uh, Google Chrome is deprecating the third-party cookies from their browser. They're sort of the last frontier of data deprecation. We've seen rounds and rounds of different data providers deprecating. So we're at a moment where we're going to have to replace a gap for advertisers specifically, and it's very unclear at this point which is going to be the best solution to do that. So there's probably going to be a number of solutions that come in. Mm -hmm. I think this is ultimately a good thing for marketers because okay. third-party data is not all that accurate, right? right. And, and consumers aren't super comfortable with it from a privacy perspective. Right. So it's really more about um, gathering, organizing, cleaning your first party data, and then activating that across channels. So when we're talking about third party data, that's like saying, okay, I'm going to this website and this website, and you know, I'm being tracked that way, and then you know, the idea behind it was, okay, they know that I went to Dick's Sporting Goods here, and I also went to Kmart there, and they can kind of build a profile based on that third party data. But what it sounds like what you're saying is that there's some accuracy issues when you're just relying on that third party data. Yeah, big time because I you know I don't know about you but in my house we have several people using the computer so you know depending on who's using the browser that's what we're going to see right but I don't need to be targeted with basketball cards from my 9-year-old son um so that's a wasted impression right. and then you add that up over time and and marketers are just wasting impressions when they don't have accurate targeting capabilities. Right. You know, it's really interesting. You talk about wasted impressions. One of the other things that I've come across both from a professional point of view, but also, you know, in my own life is you'll be scrolling around, uh, you know, looking on the web and you'll click on a site going, wow, I think this really has information I need. And then all of a sudden you're just bombarded with clickbait ads, all of that kind yeah. of stuff. And I understand that's something called, you know, made for advertising websites. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and why that's a problem. Yeah, so made for advertising websites are a huge problem and brands need to know about this because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of their display ads are, are going to made for advertising sites. Made for advertising sites are exactly what they say. So low content value. Right high advertisement to content ratio, almost twice what a regular website would be. Right. Um, and it's mostly a lot of paid traffic, right? It's not, it's not organic. Yeah. It's not the type of audience that a lot of these brands want to get in front of. Right. And then um, users, audiences, they get really frustrated by this experience because they have to be clicking off ads and really getting that really interruptive, high-frequency advertising when they're really just trying to get to the content that they want to see. Right. And I would imagine a lot of the stuff with a lot of the MFA sites that I've been on, you can't help but misclick on ads because they're popping up all over Absolutely. the place. Absolutely. And then I assume that's just a wasted impression because I'm not intending to click on something there. A hundred percent. And then when you like filter that down to mobile like yeah. and tiny, you're just poking all, all, all over the place, right? So right. these aren't real impressions. It's a waste of money for the brand. I don't know, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the ANA report that came out yeah. last year about waste in the programmatic ecosystem. Sure. MFA is like one of the top contributors to that. So uh, folks need to talk to their technology partners and their agencies and make sure that, you know, their programmatic uh, advertising is not going to these these spots. You know, I'll, I'll go out a little bit on a limb here and say that in a sense, when we're talking about MFA, we're kind of talking about ad fraud because really it seems to be what it is. Yeah, it's, it's a misrepresentation of the audience mm -hmm. insights that you're getting, right? So it's an inflation of the actual, the impact of your message, I would say. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and just, you know, I know we could probably spend all weekend talking about yes. this, <laughs> but is there anything that uh, advertisers can do to combat this 
you know, obviously they, they should be aware of what it is, but is there anything they can do in terms of, you know, using, you know, different brokers or what have you? Yeah, you know, I would say just like ask for transparency, full mm -hmm. transparency from your vendors. They should be able to give it to you. Um, the less layers between you and the consumer, that's the best way to go. That's why I always advocate um, first party data activation. Right. And now with you know AI, we're able to maybe decrease some of the bloat in our MarTech and AdTech stacks. Right. So less um, sort of bureaucracy between you and your customer would right. be great. Right. Well, I'm glad you mentioned gener generative AI because you know we haven't talked about that enough this week or this so, year. Yeah. So but, much AI talk. <laughs> but I'm I'm just curious. It sounds like there's a real opportunity to utilize generative AI, you know, to provide more personalization, which is really what it sounds like a lot of companies are trying to do. They're trying to market in a much more one-to-one -one way as yes. opposed to one-to-many. Yeah. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how generative AI might help with that. Yeah, so generative AI is kind of just like a slice of the overall you know, market and, and product capabilities available. But right. with Gen AI, what we're seeing, at least at PEGA, and mm -hmm. what I always advocate for, is that it's a tool to augment you know, I cover marketers and I, sure. I research marketers. So it's really a tool to augment um, marketing creation of content, content variation. Um, you know, I think when Gen AI first hit the scene, folks were scared that it was going to take their job away from them. <laughs> but, you know, we're seeing that human creativity outlives um, all. Right. And really, it's a way to help uh, decrease time to market hmm. for, you know, testing messages for okay. uh, creating content variations or even concepting, you know, I've seen brands use their generative AI to create sort of pre-concepts mm -hmm. that they then hand off to their external agency mm. and it reduces the amount of rounds that you go with your agency, right? So that's a big operational savings there. So what you're saying is generative AI, it's not necessarily going to re be replacing people, but really helping them do their jobs, not only more efficiently, but also expanding their productivity by, you know, almost an order, order of magnitude in some cases. Absolutely. I mean, if I think back to my days in brand marketing and the marketing ops person is like the glue that holds everything together, mm -hmm. um, this will decrease burnout in so many ways, <laughs> right? right? Because it's it's allowing us to do things more quickly that are routine you know and that means faster time to market your in-house creative people are going to be happier because sure. their stakeholders aren't going to be asking every day where their creative is mm -hmm. um it's just it's a way to really um just optimize the creative process I think. right now that all sounds great but of course with anything there are potential pitfalls yes. well, what are some of the dangers around generative AI, particularly from an enterprise point of view? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, responsible AI is really important, right? Yep. So one of the things I always talk about is uh, we have a feature called ethical bias check at PEGA, and, and that's really about looking at your data labels and understanding which um, data could potentially carry bias, right? Okay. So we're, we're thinking like age, gender, income, possible region. Mm -hmm. So really knowing why your AI is making those decisions, um, why they're serving certain pieces of content, why it's serving um, certain pieces of content to this customer and not that customer, it's really important. And then I would also say um, uh, accuracy. When you're using Gen AI, that tool is scraping the entire internet. Okay. And sometimes it hallucinates and answers without information right. so i i always check my sources always check for plagiarism and things like that because you know it, it's it's meant to help you but it's not meant to replace you so don't just you can't set it and forget it yeah i i'm wondering though uh, you know some things that i've heard about you know at this conference and at others that there are certain things that can be done in terms of grounding these AI models to a specific corpora of data. Yes. Is that something that you're seeing going on with, with customers in the market saying, hey, we understand that just sending it out to, you know, open yeah. AI everywhere is probably gonna result in the problem that you said of, you know, hallucination. Yeah, you know, I think really the foundation of all of this is the data. Okay. So if you're training your models on inaccurate or outdated data, mm -hmm. the, the outcome is gonna be that, right? If it's right. biased data, the outcome's gonna be biased. If it's um, stale data, the outcome is 
not going to be relevant to right. the consumer. Mm -hmm. So it's it's less about the technology itself and more about the data that you put into it. Right. And along with that, I think you mentioned this, it sounds like it's really important to be monitoring that data consistent. You can't just set it and forget it. You need to keep going back, check for model drift, check for bias that might be creeping in even inadvertently. Absolutely. And I, Truthfully, primarily, that's what happens. It's it's a creep. It's not an intentional. It can be intentional, but right. <laughs> it, it's rare. So, yeah. you know, it's really important to be checking that and having a human in the loop and, and understanding what's going on with the data. Right. So finally, uh, as we wrap up, maybe you can talk a little bit about what, what is PEGA doing in this space and, and, you know, what are some of the exciting things that we can look forward to over the coming six 12 months. Yeah, you know, I mean, we talked about um, first party data activation and sort of the gaps we're seeing with third party, right? Um, Customer Decision Hub is a real time decisioning engine, and we're a leader in that space. And what's great about this is that um, CDH is able to interact within milliseconds with a customer or prospect. Okay. So you're you're acting on real time insights. You can't get any fresher data than that. <laughs> so it becomes a one to one interaction. Um, you don't set, you know, a campaign schedule and blast out, you know, batches of, of pre mess pre um, settled messages. And it's really a way to uh, put hyper relevancy into your content. You can also see how your content is performing in real time. Mm. So, you know, as a campaign, former campaign marketer, I'm used to not getting the results from a campaign for, for two weeks right. after <laughs> right. um, the campaign is closed. But in this, in this new world, it's about being able to pivot in real time um, if something's not working, so. It seems like it opens up a whole world of new opportunities for marketers out there. But I'm curious, is that something that, you know, are, are these organizations set up to do that, meaning, you know, just in terms of how they look at, because yeah. traditionally it was, you know, one to many, yes. and we're going to segment going, okay, I don't know you, Tara, but I know people kind of like you, sure. and that's how we're going to target. Yeah. Now you're telling me that it's about being able to, to understand you based on your first party data. Yes. Seems like there's a real sea change there. Well, I think that in terms of where folks are on the spectrum of technology adoption, that varies. Mm -hmm. But I think that most marketers understand the value of having a truly relevant interaction with a customer. Right. So I think that um, the mind shift is going to be the, the biggest hurdle, maybe. We see a lot of, um, you know, func different functional areas within organizations. We see people ready in one functional area to move to one to one, where we might have some traditional marketers. On the other hand, sure. we see combination. But really, I think it's it's mostly about how you set up your organization, its mindset, and then the culture that you sort of set up around that as right. a marketer. And it sounds like that's something that Pega is is intimately involved with in terms of working with their customers to help them set up that organization, you know, for this sort of new framework of way of doing things. Absolutely, and you know. There's certainly a time and a place for ripping out an entire solution and, and changing it, <laughs> but it's not something that you have to do all at once. You can roll out channel by channel, um, get to the point eventually when you're, where your inbound channels data from your inbound channels is powering your outbound channels. But really, you can sort of crawl, walk, run. It's not a all at one. It doesn't have to be an all at once transformation. So, so it can be more evolutionary rather than revolutionary. A hundred percent, and you know. Increasing the efficacy on even one channel is going to help a lot, I would say. Right. Well, it certainly sounds like there's a lot going on in the space, and, and it sounds like Pega is sort of at the forefront in terms of helping to transform the ad tech and martech space. Yeah, we're really, really trying to help organizations index towards customer centricity, understanding that empathy is part of the process, right? You, you don't just want to be selling to your customers all the time. You want to be offering personalization that uh, helps them with a problem. You know, it's mm -hmm. not always about serving them. And sometimes it might even be not talking to them at all. <laughs> you know, we see what, 6,000 messages a day or something like that. Right. So maybe sometimes you don't have anything to say and that's all right too. Well, that's a revolutionary thought and we're going to stop it there. But uh, Tara, thank you so much for joining me today. Keith, thank you so much. Absolutely. It's been great to be here. All right. Well, thanks to all of you for watching. This has been Keith Kirkpatrick, Research Director at the Futurum Group for 6.5 on the Road, and we'll see you again really soon.